cutting of timber is the scientifically correct method to get the species back that we want and the speed that is desired. The landscape architects have been very busy in designing these areas to complement nearby natural openings. And once that greens up and it takes on the color of this area right in here, for example, or some of this over here, we will soon uh, arrive at a mosaic in here that's quite pleasing to the eye. In doing all this, though, in the Forest Service, which at the time had about 5,000 foresters and about 1,000 engineers and only a couple of hundred landscape architects, it was obvious that we needed a design dictionary because with the exception of the landscape architects, there were no designers in the Forest Service. All of these people had scientific or engineering backgrounds. They also were not very receptive to the textbooks of the time, which used mainly uh, urban examples. And so we started working with all these people with terms like form, line, color, and texture, pointing out in places like this that if there were vertical natural lines in the landscape, something like a ski run would fit quite well. Something going across it like a road would be a, a terrible impact. And a more horizontal landscape like this could, could absorb a road. This is a natural break here. Uh, whereas it couldn't absorb very well from a visual standpoint, a ski run. We discussed such things as the axial arrangement that has been used down through centuries to focus people's attention and thus pointed out the royal boo-boo that was created over here when a forest supervisor without realizing what was going on approved a clearing for a ski lift that uh, crossed diagonally some runs that had been put in quite well that, that matched the local uh, uh, scene, uh, preserved various uh, clumps of trees and so forth. The real, uh, the real scene here and once it was cleared why the, uh, the company decided they, uh, for some reason or other, didn't want to put a, line, uh, a lift there after all, and so it was never used. And the uh, supervisor was uh, stuck with mud on his face for many years thereafter. But at least everybody in the Forest Service knew what an axis was. <clears throat> we talked about variety and constantly got the question from these people, how much is enough? And so we would work from something like this and say A is not enough and F is probably too much. You probably ought to be somewhere in the middle like C and D. They could get that quite rapidly. Talked about contrast. The fact that these nice little openings over here which were created for deer and turkey food were all relatively the same size and quite evenly spaced and were not nearly as attractive from high points nearby as, as timber harvest down here, which were designed to fit into the countryside very well. In addition to the booklet, we were always using slideshows of one kind or another, this one mostly with engineers, to begin to discuss some of the types of variety that we really wanted to see along the roads. and sketches and so forth that would, would point out uh, what some of these things are. Finally, in 1974, we did create this visual management system, which was designed to deal with all national forest lands, the whole 200 million acres. We put the fundamentals of that out in this publication, which for some reason or other throughout the Forest Service and other federal agencies became known as the Big Eye. It dealt with the, the basics of trying to determine variety and sensitivity. Variety here, giving a class A rating to those areas that have the most variety and are the most interesting, and a class C up here on top where it's very flat, monotonous, and uninteresting. Then we'd move on and, and determine the sensitivity level one, two, or three, and this was based on how far from the viewing point is it, how many people see it, or is it not seen at all, and how much do they care? Are the people who are seeing this those who have traveled 2,000 miles to see the scenery on their vacation, or are they local folks who don't much care? By placing all of these uh, items on overlays, stacking them up once on top of another, we finally arrive 
at what we call visual quality objectives. In other words, a class A variety area, which is very interesting and has lots of variety, coupled with a sensitivity level one, meaning that lots of people see it and they care a great deal, and the foreground, it is up close where they see it quite well, leaves us with a rating of retention, which means that we will retain as much as possible the visual characteristics of that area of land, all of the orange down here. It doesn't mean keep out. It just warns the resource manager that anything that's done in there must be done in a way that the people uh, who are looking at it would be unaware of it from a visual standpoint. If they can't see it, it's OK. The other extreme would be class C, where it is very monotonous and not particularly interested from a variety standpoint, with three, which means it can't be seen because it's over the hill or something. And with that, you'd arrive at maximum modification. In other words, management activities in that area could be conducted with a good deal of modification without harm. In between, we have partial retention and modification. With the entire national forest map like this, we then have the input from the people who are the landscape architects who are concerned with scenery or the visual resource. That would be matched up with the uh, timber inventories, soil inventories, uh, uh, watershed inventories, wildlife inventories, and so forth, to come up with a forest plan that would lay out the management for that probably oh, 2 million acre area. In an area of partial retention, perhaps, which is what this was, a timber sale carried out in this manner would meet that visual quality objective. Enough uh, individual trees are left and clumps of trees so that as soon as this disturbed land greens up in the next spring, which would look about like this over here, to the average viewer, that would be almost uh, unnoticeable. Then under maximum modification, now I'm being a little bit facetious here. We never quite expected that big a modification. But under maximum modification, why uh, some rather drastic management uh, prescriptions might take place. Meeting a retention or partial retention visual quality objective when harvesting in mature and very large timber can be extremely difficult because of the contrast in texture created plus the stark wall of bare tree trunks created around any opening. One way is to start at some distance from the viewing points, which in this case is the road across the bottom here, and gradually work down the mountainside. As this area recovers and, and greens up, this partial cut is then removed, and another partial cut is made below it. And you eventually come down the mountainside, eventually opening up some openings to the road, which creates a, a viewpoint, a kind of a mystery-like uh, landscape, whereas before it was the typical long green tunnel. And, and you can, over a period of time, create a mosaic that is quite enjoyable. Uh, in the south, something like this might take 30 years. In the Pacific Northwest, it might take 100. This, this, these two slides were made from a model that was put together by uh, the children of one of our landscape architects. He had them up for days and nights uh, gluing foam to matchsticks and uh, sticking them into the board. But he, he came up with such a realistic product here that in one of his presentations thereafter, a couple of foresters got into an argument as to whether this was a Douglas fir stand or a spruce fir hemlock stand. And he said, neither one. It's a diamond match and DuPont foam. Beyond rating visual quality objectives, the Forest Service also uses what they call visual absorption capability a VAC system. In those cases where the manager really wants to know how difficult is it going to be to meet retention, partial retention, or whatever, <coughs> and occasionally wants to know what it'll cost. In a landscape like this, we find that the left portion of it in here 
has a very high VAC rating. It can absor visually absorb a great deal of impact. It would be quite easy to design a road, power line, or timber sale, or whatever in that area, and blend it into the countryside so well that you wouldn't be aware of it. The area on the other side, however, has a very low VAC rating and will absorb almost nothing from a visual standpoint without a great deal of contrast. And so the relative cost of meeting any visual quality objective would be much lower in this area than, than in this one. An example of this might be this ski area, which is built in a landscape of very high VAC. It just naturally absorbs this kind of a visual impact from a distance would probably meet retention visual quality objectives, and yet is a highly developed ski area. Thus, we find ourselves designing whole mountainsides to be both productive and attractive, moving through various stages of timber manipulation and eventually arriving at a mosaic that over time will roll over, so to speak. This area in here, during the next stage, will begin to look like this. This will begin to look like the dense solid timber, which will be removed and look like this. And every time it, it rolls over, uh, you end up with a different landscape, but one that's quite attractive and one that can be maintained forever and ever. Then we come to the rather exciting prospect, or we did over time, of the new tools that are available to do some of these things. The birth of the jet engine made helicopters powerful enough that they could lift heavy weights at high altitudes. And so we were able to uh, coerce, you might say, some power companies into using uh, helicopters to install towers rather than the old method of building a zigzag road up the mountainside with all of the scarring attendant there too in order to get their dozers and cranes and trucks to the top of the mountain. This is now accepted procedure, and in fact, you'll find quite a few power companies in various parts of the country who think they thought it up in the first place. In some areas, timber harvesting has gone to the balloon, which gives them the ability to lift logs up from inaccessible sites, take them over uh, ridges and down to where they can be loaded. Uh, again, enabling uh, forest or tree harvest without mid-slope road building, which is the primary source of not only erosion, but uh, visual impact as well. There were even various ex uh, experiments with all sorts of aerodynamic uh, balloons and whatnot, but they've pretty well gone back to the round ones now, being the simplest way of doing it. The helicopters have all come in very handy for uh, harvesting large value uh, timber in areas where there's a sh only a short haul involved. They're very expensive, but they can do the job that nothing else can do if the conditions are right. The Forest Service also developed a new engineered transportation system for log hauling, one that's biodegradable, has a very low soils impact, and is efficient. Uh, however, it doesn't seem to go in the proper direction all the time, so they're still working on that to see if they can't perfect it. Then came perhaps the most useful tool of them all, the computer. The perspective plot program, which the Forest Service is using to design all sorts of things, from timber sales to uh, ski areas. And we're now going to see a three-part videotape here. The first part arrives at this kind of a solution for designing various sites. The second part is dynamic perspective plot, which is kind of the Forest Service equivalent to Star Wars. They're experimenting with uh, computer-created line drawings produced in such rapid succession that it makes a movie. And you're taken down a road at high speed, approaching and then passing mountains on which are shown proposed timber harvest clear cuts. Now, it's a great temptation in this thing to watch the car going down the road rather than the mountainsides. But see if you can't focus on the mountainsides and notice how the computer draws a line around the peri perimeter of the proposed opening and then draws a small stick figure trees around that line so that you can see how much of the opening will actually be uh, seen and how much will be screened from view by the trees on the downhill side. 
The third part of the tape is a copy of a cable news network newscast of the use of the perspective plot technology in designing a ski area, this one here, Beaver Creek in Colorado, and shows the use of the latest equipment which the Forest Service now has, which is 10 times as fast as what is seen in the first part of the videotape. Clear as mud. Let's uh, give that a try here. We have the lights. The uh, Forest Service chose that 300 mile an hour speed going down the road because Dr. Spangler assured me that for Ball State students that was about average. And that the faculty traveled that fast while driving the 12 passenger van. The cable news network, I think, uh, show is, a, is an excellent example of some opportunities that await all of our design professions in, in the use of uh, computers. Uh, those people have got a lot of air time to fill up, and uh, we can show them some pretty neat things these days that, that we are doing with computers that uh, really gets their attention. Um, you've been a marvelous audience, and that's all I uh, have for the, for the afternoon, sir. Well, it's kind of up to the imagination of the, the people that are playing with it. Uh, we've had a good deal of interest, of course, from various industries, such as power generation that uh, want to run lines and so forth. Uh, anybody who's out there making quite an impact on the landscape. Uh, sand and gravel, uh, quarries, uh, all of that sort of thing. Anytime that you want to, in advance, get a pretty darn accurate picture of what something like that is going to look like, uh, it's a great uh, opportunity. Are we limited in scale? I don't think so. It, it is all taken or done from a viewpoint, so whatever you can see uh, from one or many viewpoints uh, is what you'll get. Oh yeah, yeah. sure. That, that's what the forest supervisor gets paid for. Uh, first of all, it allows you to show the public in all of the public listening sessions that we get into with forest planning uh, just what these various combinations might look like if we went this way or that way. And uh, they will make a very strong input. Uh, we, we can show them what it will look like if we do this kind of timber harvesting or if we do that kind. We can show them what's been recommended by the visual, uh, the VQO process, uh, the timber industry can say that'll cost you 77 jobs in this community. Uh, the ranchers can say uh, it'll help me graze another 500 cattle, uh, on and on and on, and, until you begin to add up what these things are worth to you. It allows you to make some very sensible.